Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Gross, and I am president of the organization Communities United Against Police Brutality. We are here today to talk about um, problems with the BCA and the role that they have played in investigating deadly force incidents around the state. But in particular, we're going to focus on the case of Thurman Blevins. Uh, we will tell you how we came to our conclusions. Uh, we've provided for you a report of um, our reinvestigation of that case. And again, you know, we'll tell you about how we reached our conclusions. But first, we want to start by showing you how the encounter with Mr. Blevins got started. And I do need to warn you that there is um, profanity on the part of the officers when this incident starts. And to just help, help you understand the context, Mr. Blevins um, was fairly intoxicated. In fact, he was quite intoxicated. He was sitting on a curb talking to a friend of his and basically just um, kind of, uh, you know, socializing with people in the community when he, um, when he was approached by um, officers um, Schmidt and Kelly. So if we can go ahead and uh, play that video, and again, my fair warning that there is serious profanity in this video. He's got a gun. Put your fucking hands up now! So this was how the encounter with Mr. Blevin started. But before the encounter with Mr. Blevin started, there was actually something that had happened in the neighborhood. Someone had called to say that about four blocks away from where Mr. Blevins was sitting with other people in the community, including a, a mom with a baby in a baby carriage, as you saw, um, someone had called to say that someone was shooting a gun in the air and into the ground about four blocks away. Um, squads number 460 and 470 had gone to the area and looked around and found a man who fit the description of what the caller said you know, the, uh, in the 911 call. They were in the middle of apprehending the gentleman, had actually stopped him and so forth, and had called for backup. Squad number 420 then drove to the, to the scene, but before they could get to the scene, they stopped, they saw Mr. Blevins, and they started this encounter. Um, so we're gonna go into what all happened during this incident and the ways that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the Minneapolis Police Department, and Hennepin County um, uh, Attorney Mike Freeman collude, uh, collided, excuse me, my apologies, colluded together to deny this family justice. Um, but first we wanna talk a little bit about our organization and the uh, role of our reinvestigation work group. And Nicole. Hi. Um, my name is Nicole Kessering and I have been doing these reinvestigations with CUAPB for about four and a half, five years now. Um, obviously for every police killing there is that conventional narrative. The police, the police come out with their story, they explain the situation, and the county attorney then comes out and finds their finding based on the investigation of whether it's the BCA or another police department. What the reinvestigation work group does is we search through all available um, information that we can find, whether it's the completed BCA investigation, we get data requests, we go through all the video, we go through all the interviews, and it's usually about a year-long process for us to go back over all of this. We come, this report was 2,165 pages. We went through every page numerous times. Um, we pulled everything out that we can on this investigation, and then we wrote a finalized version of the report that all of you should have received today. Thank you. These reinvestigations, um, again, are very, very important to the community because when uh, what we've learned over doing several of these investigations is that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension tends to investigate in ways that shore up the city's narrative. And so um, let's start the PowerPoint. You, are you having it on now? Okay. So basically, the, 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 the city's conventional narrative in this particular case is that a 911 caller notifies the police that a black man is firing a handgun into the air and into the ground. Um, police officers respond to that call and they find Mr. Blevins, um, who has a gun in his pocket and a large bottle of alcohol in his hand. Um, Mr. Blevins refuses to uh, orders to drop the gun and he flees the police until he removes the gun from his pocket and begins to turn toward police. Then the officers, in fear of their lives, um, from Mr. Blevins, shoot him. And then there are no charges filed. And that, again, is the conventional narrative that we all heard about at the time that this incident occurred. 
But our organization did a deep dive into both the 2165 page um, report from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, but also into several other documents. We did extensive amounts of data requests, and we went to the scene and took measurements ourselves and um, analyzed the data ourselves. And so once we did that, we have a much different narrative about what actually happened here. And so that, I think, is very important. So if you can speak. Alrighty. So we're going to talk a little bit about these findings that we um, have developed in this particular case, um, it, starting with the timeline, um, the, it, the beginning of the incident, uh, a failure on the part of the police to render aid, um, some manufactured evidence, which is really, I think, the most stark thing that I'm eager to talk about this morning um, from the BCA, and um, some incidents, you know, some question about what, what the police actions did in terms of public safety, and then um, finally we will talk about, um, you know, our own demands related to this particular in, uh, investigation. So let's talk about the start of the incident. Um, Mr. Um, Blevins had purchased a gun from his friend about um, three hours before the incident occurred, roughly. And so he had just bought the, the gun, you know, had didn't have it for very long at all. Um, it's not clear to us why he bought the gun, but we believe he was getting threatened by some people. And so he purchased a gun, and then from there he went into the backyard um, of his apartment and sat with several people drinking. And so he was pretty intoxicated. Then um, about three hours later, a call comes in to 911 saying a black man has shot into the air and into the ground um, about four blocks away from where Thurman was at that time. Thurman left his apartment, um, not knowing any of this, of course, and walked a few blocks um, to meet his friends at Lindale, and then they were sitting on the curb, minding their own business, talking. Um, he was quite intoxicated at that point, but again, they were just, he was sitting on the curb, they were just on the corner talking. Um, one of the people, it was um, a woman with a baby in a baby carriage. At that point, squads 460 and 470, as we said before, um, attempted to locate the individual. They did find a, a man who um, met the description. They actually took his backpack off of him, and he um, had a BB gun in his backpack. Um, and we don't know if this was the gentleman or not, because at that point, shortly thereafter, they got a call from squad 420 to come to the other location and support squad 420. Um, as I mentioned before, squad 420, um, instead of going to help squads 460 and 470, who had, had apprehended the man that was likely the individual that was called about, um, instead of doing that, they stopped when they saw Mr. Blevins, who, again, was minding his own business, committing no crimes, and basically just started a whole scenario with him. So once 420 got on the scene, they immediately, as you saw from the video before, jumped out of their squad cars, screaming obscenities, da 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 Again, keep in mind that Mr. Blevins had committed no crimes except, you could say, possibly public drunkenness. But they didn't even know that. They had no idea that he committed any such crime. And so they immediately got out, immediately started screaming. I think it's important to note that Officer Schmidt was a trainer in a fear-based training program. He, wasn't, he hadn't just gone to fear-based training, but he was a trainer in that program. And I think that that very well could have influenced his approach to this situation. But he got out screaming. They were screaming about him having a gun, but interestingly, they did not take cover. So clearly they weren't worried he was going to use a gun on them, and in fact he didn't have it out. It was just the butt of the gun sticking out of his pocket that they could see. Now also bear in mind that over 300,000 people in the state have um, permits to carry. And he wasn't aware whether or not uh, Mr. Blevins had, per had a permit to carry. It might have been perfectly legal for him to have that gun in his pocket. But you saw the way that he jumped out and approached Mr. Blevins screaming um, and yelling obscenities. Um, I'm certain from the way that you saw Mr. Blevins jump up from the curb and start running that he was startled. Um, I've seen this video in slow motion over and over again as part of our investigation, and it was clear that Mr. Blevins and the woman with the baby carriage and others were all startled and they all just scattered off in different directions, um, you know, frightened. Um, you know, Schmidt started screaming and hollering, you know, put it down, put it down. And um, I think we can go to the next video. That, so he's screaming, put it down, put it down. And Mr. Blevins clearly thinks that they're talking about his liquor because he's, oh, my liquor, man, oh, my, my liquor. He wanted to hold on to his liquor because he just bought this bottle of liquor earlier. 
and they're screaming, put it down, put it down. You can see him throw the bottle down, and he, then he says, there it is, there it is. So he is thinking they're talking about his liquor bottle. They, he doesn't even remember, we think he doesn't even remember that he bought a gun three hours earlier. And so he's thinking he's dispensed with the problem. And then finally, Schmidt yells to him, you've got a gun, mother, and I won't say that other part. And Thurman said, no, I don't, no, I don't. And Schmidt called back, yes, you do. And so we think again that he never even remembered that he had that gun in his pocket. He also says it's back there because he was referring to the bottle of alcohol right. in the intersection that he dropped. It's back right. there, it's back man. there. It's back there. Thank you. Good. Very good point. Yeah. Join in. Join in. Um, so at that point, he's still running for his life because now he's really frightened because he's got this screaming, crazy cop running behind him. And he starts running down and he runs down the alleyway and he starts to plead with the officer over his shoulder. He keeps talking over his shoulder while he's running forward saying, please don't shoot me, please don't shoot me, leave me alone, things like that. And then Schmidt said, put your hands up. And he says, leave me alone, leave me alone. And, or possibly he says, I'm unarmed, we're not, not sure about that. We played that many times to try to detect what he said. But then finally Schmidt says, put your hands, and then he opens fire. At that point, Schmidt shot, fired three shots before his partner Kelly, who was about 120 feet or so behind him, um, even pulled his gun out. But once he pulled his gun out, he went nuts shooting. That guy was the poster child, and we'll talk about this, of uh, reckless uh, firearm use, uh, because he started shooting up the whole neighborhood. Between them, there were 14 shots in total, eight by Schmidt and six by Kelly. Um, at that point, Thurman, at shot number about six or so, Thurman hit the ground. He lay there moaning, four shots had hit him. Um, he lay there moaning, and he was moving his arms and moaning and things like that. Um, another officer ran up and kicked the, you know, Thurman's gun, which by that point had popped out of his pocket, kicked his gun out of the way. And then they still watched him lay there and moan in agony and move until he died. Mm -hmm. The interesting part, though, is that Officer Kelly is an EMT instructor, an EMT instructor. He instructed paramedics. And he had a jump kit in his car that he chose to not use. And we'll come back to that in a second. So the bottom line is that they did not, he did not do anything with that. Can I have something to say about this one? Yes, please do. Okay. And introduce yourself. Please. Sure. My name is Emma Peterson. Uh, my last name is spelled P-E-D as in David, E-R-S-O-N. Um, so one of the things with Kelly is that he was not only an EMS instructor, he was a tactical EMS instructor, uh, which means that he was specifically trained on how to provide aid to people who may have weapons or may be dangerous. The other thing is that he um, also provides first aid training for the Minneapolis Police Department. I myself was a Minneapolis Police Explorer for five and a half years, and Officer Kelly was one of the uh, Minneapolis Police Officers that taught the Explorer program how to use first aid. Uh, so he knows how to administer first aid, um, and he chose not to. That's right. That's he right. actually specifically said it wasn't his job. Yeah. And he had a tactical bag mm -hmm. in his car. Mm -hmm. He actually specifically said it was not his job, and he actually has and carries a tactical bag in the trunk of his police squad. That's mm -hmm. right. In fact, when he said it was not his job, he said, oh, that will be their job. And he was referring to the EM EMS folks who were not even on the scene at that point. And as anybody knows, and he certainly would have known as an instructor, um, time is absolutely of the essence in a critical injury like that. And so, um, you know, he chose not to provide care in a situation that he actually created the danger for. So that kind of thing. So other kinds of issues that we um, that we explored was the fact that Schmidt again was a trainer with Archway Defense, a fear-based um, law enforcement training company. Um, also, the fact that Kelly was about 120 feet behind Schmidt when he opened fire, but yet in his interview with the BCA, he claimed he could see down the barrel of the gun. Now, I, you know, I don't know how good your eyes are or mine or whatever, but I think it's highly doubtful that you could see from 120 feet down the barrel of a gun. That's a pretty ridiculous statement. Um, and we're going to show you why it's even more ridiculous, because in fact, Thurman never pointed a gun at them in the first place. Um, he also claimed that somehow Thurman was leading them into an ambush, 
But now Thurman had no way to know that they were actually coming. So how would he have been able to plan in advance to lead them into some kind of an ambush? You know, doesn't that take at least some measure of advance planning? So it's a pretty ludicrous, um, you know, situation. The other thing that might very well have led into this situation is it may be that the gentleman who called 911, and we don't know this for sure, but through um, some data practice requests, it may be that the gentleman um, who called 911 was in fact calling on Thurman, and it was because he owed Thurman money. And he and Thurman had had a text exchange earlier in the day saying, you're overdue to pay me back, please pay me back. And so we have that. Yeah, so this, um, it may have been the situation. Again, we don't know because you can't really find out who made a 911 call, but it appears that that might be the case and that sort of thing. And we um, got this information by obtaining Mr. Blevins' cell phone records through a data request. One other thing that is another factor in this whole thing, there is no shot spotter evidence that any bullets were ever fired in that area at the time frame for the 911 call. There's no evidence on the shot spotter whatsoever. And that shot spotter report is actually in the report that we gave you. Um, further, 25 witnesses never saw or heard anyone shooting a gun in that area. Um, there were people that were nearby, that worked from home, that would have been able to hear this, had their windows open on that day, and so forth, and um, never heard any kind of um, shooting in the area whatsoever. And despite that, by the way, I should mention that the BCA never interv interviewed those individuals who said that there were no bullets fired. So let's take a look at the city's narrative. One of their narratives is that Thurman had a gun in his hand, and that's false. What we want to show you is really, I think, the most important part of this whole thing. The Bureau of Criminal Apprehension sent out the raw body camera footage to a, an organization called the National Center for Audio and Video Forensics, NCAVF, out of California. They basically stabilize the footage because, you know, when people are running, things can get a little blurry. They stabilize the footage, and then they thought, you know, and then they pointed out that they were um, highlighting helpful portions of, you know, of the, of the video, and even drew red circles around what they claimed to be the gun. And so um, what I think is important, do you want to do the pointer? So you can see the difference between this the This is the original. And as you can see, that's a hubcap, a tire, and the front end of a vehicle. And as you can see over here, they squared it. This is round. You can see it's round. Extra pixels, they squared it. And this is that same. Because if you look at the location of it, you can just match it right up with the background. And right, which is what we did. Side. And there was also an oil stain in front, and that's how we originally traced it. And as you can see, this is a picture of, it was a Benjamin Franklin plumbing truck. And the hubcap and this front end is what they circled, claiming to be the weapon in Thurman's hand at that moment. That's right, that's right. So go to the next frame, if you please, because mm -hmm. that really shows it. Um, what you'll see here is, um, Again, as he's approaching the Benjamin Franklin truck, and then you, you want to go ahead? As he's approaching the Benjamin Franklin truck, you can see it's right here. I mean, look at, here's the front, the blue, it's a blue truck, the silver, this is the bumper, and the hubcap. Where'd it go? Where's the truck? You know, you still have the silver, but the actual, you can see the hood right here, the faint line, but it's not visible anymore. Okay, the other thing is, as you can see, and this is another thing, look at his elbow. Thurman's elbow is here. They blacked it out and put it into this garbage can because his elbow was like this. And you can see, it looks like he's like this when he's actually like this because he was running. Right, and you'll see in a minute why that, it, that the, air, the position of the elbow is absolutely they key also, to this whole question. And they also blacked out his face so it looks like he's turning backwards when you can actually see he was, because if you watch this as many times as we watch this, you can see where Thurman is actually looking and what the situation is. But it is questionable where that vehicle went. It's questionable why these are highlighted the way they are when you can see it's very clearly right here. So then this gives you like a, yet a better um, 
picture of that of the frame of that whole you know the frame of reference and how they managed to make his elbow go away on the his uh, right elbow as well as um, the actual um, you know truck. Yes. So now you see that round circle is where they're claiming was a gun and that he was pointing it at the officers. This is the same photo blown out. And as you can see, there's his elbow. And they're blacking it out to make it look like he's turning more than what he is. That's right. That's right. And again, there, there's yet another um, view. You look inside the red circle, they added pixels literally to make the merged truck pixels appear more like a gun. Is that the firm they hired that did that, or the BCA? It was the, the BCA hired that firm, okay. Okay. and then they made a, a big splash and a big production about um, this this company proved that he had a gun and all of this business when no such thing actually is true. So, um, are you on the next one? Okay. And this company actually used this incident and their work on it to advertise themselves. They put together an ad, and what you'll notice in this ad is that the officers look very angelic in this ad. You know, they're they're framed up on, and, and, and there's this was actually a two-part ad. The first part was like, you know, a man was shot in the back. He's on the ground, and witnesses say he never had a gun. It's a it's a, a formula for an uprising in the Minneapolis. You know, they had all this like splashy stuff. And that kind of thing. And then this is the second page of that ad. And they used it to promote, you know, we quickly went into action to prove those dumb citizens were wrong, basically, is, is kind of the framing. And to, to frame the cops as these very angelic people, as you can see in this, um, in this particular photo. It's really crazy. So the second part of the city narrative is that, again, Thurman pointed a gun at the officers. Well, not so fast. We held a photo session with a model. We worked with a professional photographer um, that we hired to do a photo session with a model who was the same height and weight as Thurman. And this model, we posed him in the exact same position as Mr. Blevins, except he couldn't keep his foot up for the entirety of the time because it was, you know, uh, several minutes, right? Um, but but otherwise, it, he toe tapped to keep his foot, you know, keep himself stable. But he was posed in the exact same position of as Mr. Blood is at the point at which um, NACVS or, um, claimed that he had um, basically, uh, you know, pointed toward the officers um, while they conveniently, you know, blacked out his elbow. Uh, we put him in the exact same position, and then we took pictures of him every six inches all the way around. These are not all the pictures, but these are some of them, and they're the ones that at least show the angles, you know, the rest are just kind of seeing him from the back and different other things. And all of the photos, by the way, are in your report. But what you can see here is that if your arm is out here and you happen to be holding a gun, which we do not believe he was holding a gun, but to, to be fair, we posed him with a replica of the, uh, a plastic replica of the same weight and type of gun that Mr. Blevins owned. And we, as you can see, it is impossible to have your elbow here and be able to reach all the way here. You would have to have an arm twice as long as it actually is. It's just not physically possible to do it. And so, again, this um, you know shows you that that narrative of, the, of him pointing a gun at the officers, as well as Kelly's narrative that he could see down the barrel of a gun from 120 feet away, is nonsensical. And yet the BCA did nothing with that. And so, you can see how we we did this work. One quick thing too, as you can see in this photograph. Before that other photograph they had, the entire elbow was blurred into the garbage can as I showed you. But in this photograph, you can see between, there's white where the garage is, mm -hmm. right? So it's those little differences that we really analyzed and looked over and, you know, we questioned what it means. That's exactly right. Um, again, you know, um, challenging the, the city's narrative. This should have been a job that was done by the BCA. Not a group of all volunteer community organizers and community activists. I mean, this is to me ridiculous that it's the community that has to bring out the truth of the BCA that is trying to cover the truth and spread lies. So then the third part of the narrative is that Thurman shot at the officers. And when you listen to the, you know, that unfolding narrative on TV, you can believe that he shot at the officers. You know, um, Bob Kroll even said back when he was, you know, Federation president, said on TV that um, 
that they were forced to fire at a suspect only after he pointed the gun and fired at officers. That was um, a quote that he gave in the media. Um, and Schmidt, the officer who opened fire on Blevins, spoke in his interview, you know, at, 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 any, at any point does the suspect point a gun at you? Schmidt, not, not, that I, not that I can see, this is him, you know, saying it, okay? Not that, not that I can see, by the time I made the decision to use deadly force on, uh, I had focused on my front side. I'm not quite sure what that means. The other officer, again, Kelly, was at, by that point, you know, at least 120 feet back. He might have been as much as 140 feet back. And he says, I see his arm coming up, and all I hear is a couple of shots. And now I have, now he's pointing a silver handgun directly at me, and I remember seeing that barrel pointed right at me, and I'm pretty sure he got a shot off, and I don't know where it went. So again, lies, lies, lies to cover their own actions and activities. But we've got something to show you here. These are the sound waves. This is a graphical representation of the sound waves from Schmidt's body camera. And what you will see on there are there are exactly 14 waves that represent gunshots, 14 of them. And the officers between them shot 14 times. You do not see another wave <coughs> representing any other gunfire. <coughs> So we now know for a fact that he did not shoot in that area. Right. So again, another lie. And there's other evidence that, the, that Thurman never shot at the officers because uh, there is other evidence and there's also <coughs> other efforts to confuse the evidence. For example, the medical examiner, when they came to the scene to take Thurman's body away, they covered his hands with paper bags that they taped down, which is a standard procedure for medical examiners to preserve the hands so that they can be tested for gunshot residue. Neither the medical examiner's office nor the BCA ever tested his hands. Ever. And that's, out, that's outrageous because that is a standard mm -hmm. procedure in shootings to test the hands of the person that you claim has shot a gun. Standard procedure. The BCA's own testing of Thurman's gun showed that his DNA was on the uh, grip, the magazine, and the bullets, which he had just purchased a gun, so none of that's surprising. But there was no DNA and no fingerprints on the trigger. A bystander in the alleyway, a Mr. Chris Case, was down at the other end of the alleyway. He had just pulled into the alleyway when this incident occurred, and the guns started blazing. He actually, his car was shot through the windshield and the, a bullet ended up in his headrest. Fortunately for Mr. Case, he had gotten out of the um, car just a moment or two before that happened. So very fortunately for him, he was not shot. His girlfriend was sitting in the passenger side and she was nearly shot as well. Because again, Kelly was wildly shooting all over the place. Um, but Mr. Chris Case said, the suspect, I never, seen him shoot once. And this was in a BCA interview. And the last word goes to county attorney Mike Freeman, who said, quote, I cannot tell you that there is sufficient proof that he, in fact, lined up and shot at the officers. So he's saying that there's no proof of it either. But yet they allowed this narrative that he shot at the officers, he pointed a gun at the officers, all of that kind of stuff to marinate in the public eye without correcting it in any real way. So we want to talk a little bit about the scene and the scene safety itself. As the incident with Mr. Case illustrates, the officers were shooting wildly in a very uh, dense neighborhood with a lot of activity. Of the 14 bullets, um, all of them, except the four that were in Mr. Blevins, ended up in all kinds of different places, garages, the tire of a trash bin, um, all kinds of different other places. One of them in Mr. Case's headrest. He could easily have been a victim in this matter had he not gotten out of his car quickly. They ended up all over the garages and houses of that area. And, you know, to open fire in such an irresponsible way when, in fact, no one is pointing a gun at you, no one is shooting at you, and you have just been charged up with all of your fear-based training and you just open fire on a, an intoxicated man who is not doing anything like that, except running away from you because of your screaming and hollering. Um, to do that is so incredibly irresponsible 
that it just begs the question. And can you go to the next one? And again, Officer Kelly is he's literally the poster child for reckless shooting. His bullets ended up everywhere, just all over the place. Um, you know, and, and so there was a whole notion of like, oh, we, he had to do it because of officer safety. What about the safety of the community? What about the safety of the community? You are wildly shooting in ways that could easily have killed other people. And why? Because a man ran away from you. That's outlandish to us. So the bottom line is that the Minneapolis police lied. They, they issued the original picture that cut off Thurman's elbow, and they lied in the media about what actually happened. The BCA lied, and all the ways that we talked to you about, including manufacturing evidence, and the county attorney, Mike Freeman, lied in his final report because he adopted wholesale the lies of the MPD and the BCA and failed to bring any criminal charges against Schmidt and Kelly. So now that it's clear that these um, agencies have, have colluded to avoid accountability for Officer Schmidt and Kelly, we have some demands. We demand that this case be reopened and that Attorney General um, Keith Ellison appoint a special prosecutor. We demand that the BCA immediately cease investigating all incidents of police deadly force. We demand that the individuals involved in manufacturing this evidence be prosecuted. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we demand that the state legislature create an independent agency for the investigation and potential prosecution of all incidents of police deadly force. An agency that is separate of and outside of law enforcement and county prosecutor's offices. Yes. We must have these things because this is only one example of the kinds of phony prosecutions that have existed in this state and have denied people justice for years. This is unacceptable. All right, and, and with that, I'm going to turn over speaking to Jaylani Hussein. First of all, I just want to acknowledge the incredible work put together by CUADB's team, um, the volunteers, the amount of hours spent to uh, unveil what is um, a cover-up. Um, I think for Thurman Blevin, um, him being a black man in America killed him that day. Him being uh, someone who is not affluent killed him that day. But what really is tragedy here and what many communities and the coalition and many of the folks that have been coming forth asking is that we do not believe that the police departments in, in this country can hold themselves accountable to the crimes that they commit against our community. And one of the reasons why is, as Michelle laid out, the layer of cover-up, the compounded cover-up, and clear fraudulent activities that are happening when officers kill human beings. In this case, it is clearly shown to you that the officers on the scene had no business even going after Thurman Blevins because they actually found the person that they were looking for and the shot spotters cleared that, that there was nobody actually shooting in that area, other than what would have been the man with the BB gun who was actually looked at. The second point that I think is very clear to understand here is that the officers, if they were in danger and saw a gun and needed, the first instincts of their training and someone who trains here should have been to cover and protect themselves and protect the people. But instead, they did what they usually do, hunt and chase black men into alleys and kill them and say that they had guns. And this is exactly what happened to Thurman Blevins. Yeah. In this case, Thurman Blevins was a black man, unfortunately somebody who was drunk, but the reality is he was just a black man. And the cover-up that started with these two officers, the medical uh, examiner who refused to check the hands of Thurman Blevins is an example of what happened with George Floyd. That is why we are seeing a compounded layer of protection of police officers before even it arrives at the desk of Mike Freeman. And we know Mike Freeman 
has history historically has never seen the value of black lives. Mm -hmm. And in this case, has never seen his officers ever commit crimes unless the officer is black, right? Or it's Derek Chauvin and the whole world saw the brutality of Derek Chauvin and the other three officers. I think to Thurman Blevins' family, and particularly to the many people who came out in protesting for Thurman Blevins, but then forgot Thurman Blevins. And the many who ran away from standing up for Thurman Blevins because of the police narratives, shame on you. Shame on you for ignoring perhaps one of the biggest cover-ups in this case. This case is a layered, compounded cover-up by the police department, by the officers, by the BCA, and by a third party that has been used to literally doctor a video to create it to seem like there was a gun there. But the reality is justice is always on the side of the people. And if it wasn't for the hard work and this entire document that shows and proves that Thurman Blevins should have never been killed, Thurman Blevins' killing was a murder by those two officers is a proof of that. And today we ask those people who walked away from Thurman Blevins to read this report and see what you walked away from. You walked away from another murder of an innocent man because this police department will protect their own by any means necessary. They will lie, they will, they, they will not tell the truth. And the BCA, the days that you take word value from the BCA should have been over a long time ago. But now we see that the BCA is not only working with third party to project their lies, but they are presenting it as facts. And so we call right now Governor Walsh, I added into this then Governor Walsh, to suspend the BCA, to completely shut down the BCA, and, uh, and offer an, uh, an independent investigation to any and all police shootings that happen in the state of Minnesota. We know prosecutors, just as they did with Winston Smith, will never bring justice. They will never bring justice because they are conflicted out because of their role and their partnership with police departments across the state. I want to thank again the hard work and I will just say to Thurman Blemitt's family and to the many people, we must demand justice by any means necessary. Thank you. And now we'll bring up Tashira Garraway with Families Supporting Families Against Police Violence. Hello. I am also the fiance and the mother of Justin Tykin, who was brutally beat to death by the St. Paul police and thrown inside of a trash dumpster August 19, 2009. My heart goes out to Thurman Blevin's family today because I have lived a cover up. My family, my son, has lived a cover up here in the state of Minnesota. I come out and I put my life on the line because of these cover-ups by the BCA and by the police departments. I watched the video of Thurman Blevins. I seen a man run, possibly out of fear being afraid and scared. And then I watched those officers shoot at him as he was running away. But the only time that you are supposed to shoot at someone is when your life is in imminent danger. They teach you that in the gun license class. If your life is not in imminent danger, right there in that moment, then you are not to shoot or kill any other human being. And we seen in that video, we seen in that video that, that both of those officers' lives were not in imminent danger. If someone is running away from you, they're trying to get away, that doesn't constitute a death sentence because they're trying to get away. We know, we have seen over and over and over again. If you stay there, they will take your life as they did George Floyd. Or you can run for your life. And your life will still be taken without the officer's lives ever being in danger. 
Our community is tired and we demand Governor Watts to shut the BCA down. Mm -hmm. The BCA is the reason for all of these cover-ups. Mm -hmm. Our families are out here in the community suffering and hurting thanks to the BCA's work and their quote-unquote investigation. These are not investigations. These are cover-ups. And it's too many families coming forward and telling the truth about what happened to their loved ones for this to be just some facade. This is our lives. We are human beings. We love those people that they stole from us. They are not fake human beings. Okay, he was intoxicated. Who hasn't been intoxicated? But that constituted his murder? He was still a human being. He still deserved to live. He still had children. He still had people that loved him. How can you people out there living just know that this happened to another human being and just sit there and do nothing? How can you work in the BCA and see on a video what really happened and cover up the murder? How can you be a human being and do that? How can you be the governor? How can you be the attorney general? How can you be anything in this state sitting in legislative seats and know that this is happening to human beings and sit there and let it happen? Enough is enough. And I live my life knowing that my life is on the line from my own child that only has one parent thanks to the St. Paul Police Department beating his father to death and covering up the murder. I've seen it with my own eyes. So I know that every other murder that was gonna come after him was going to be a cover up because I live the cover up. I live the intimidation. I live being followed. I live the police sitting outside my home with me and my son in the home. All for a cover up. This is inhumane behavior. This is not human being behavior. And it's not human being behavior for this state to continue the people that are in the seats to continue to let it happen. So we are demanding again, we are demanding the BCA be shut down immediately, immediately. It has been proven today that they have covered up a murder and there's hundreds of more murders in the last 20 something years that and hundreds of bodies that they have helped cover up. It's sad, it's inhumane, and it's hurtful. How much do you guys expect the community to continue to take? The reason that we've seen the outcry that we've seen with George Floyd is because the community's backs have been pushed up against the wall and the community can't take anymore. It's going to take one more murder like George Floyd's and the place is going to go back up where it was before. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? But you're pushing the people to that point. And you cannot blame the people for hurting the people and the people reacting to the hurt. You cannot blame the people for that. What would you do if these was your loved ones? What would you do if Thurman Blevins was your brother? What would you do if he was your family? Enough is enough in our community demands the BCA be shut down. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Paul Johnson, who was the roommate of Travis Jordan before he was killed. Paul? It's coming up on the three-year angel anniversary of the murder of my friend Travis Jordan on my front lawn after th roughly three minutes and 45 seconds of what the police like to call their de-escalation techniques. I'd like to thank CUAPB for the tireless work that you did in Travis's case. As well as my own uh, from Paul after the police uh, imprisoned me in the back of their car telling me that my friend was alive and okay, barring me from seeing him at the hospital, barring me from saying goodbye to him, holding me there for an hour and a half illegally, illegally searching my things and not allowing me to even have the, the window open, to be quite honest. We have current leadership that sits by and waits 
for the BCA, the police department, and any other government agencies to tell them that it's okay that you didn't fire those police. We have leadership that is in their contract to advocate for the people. When we have admitted 11 pieces of state legislation that would provide accountability, that would provide transparency, and would provide a road and a path to possibly, possibly start to repair the relationship that the police, BCA, and all of those said agencies are responsible directly for destroying with the community. It is not the community that has destroyed the relationship with the police. We are not the ones that have stayed in their cars, not communing with the people, and not understanding where they are policing. Our public safety, our personas, and our human experience, as well as our cultures and our diversity. They come into our town, murder our people, and go back to whatever sundown town that they exist from outside of Minneapolis. This is unacceptable. Jacob Fry is unacceptable for standing back and allowing his people, his police force that he is directly in charge of, to be a part of task force that have no accountability, that have not even interviewed with the BCA concerning Winston Smith and refused to. There is zero evidence, once again, the medical examiner washing the hands before getting any of this said gunpowder residue off of his hands that they say he fired when the direct witness within the car says there was no gun, there was no firing, and all of the camera work in, within Uptown, where is it? Not a shred of evidence these people put forth, and yet our leadership stands by it. They do not come out and condemn the false reports of things like murder charges being, being found for murder charges and things like that. They allow those things to perpetuate themselves within the media so that years later we are trying to come back and get justice for these people. Years later, the media has allowed people to believe the false things that once a man is murdered or a person is murdered, they allow their character to be assassinated so that they can be forgotten and pushed and rolled over. No more. Minneapolis, we must demand better. We absolutely must demand better from council leadership. They must stand and advocate for the people first and always must do that. It is their obligation. We are the ones who put them there. Hold them to the fire. All power to the people. Thank you. And finally, we will hear from Emma Peterson, um, who you heard from earlier. She's going to kind of bring us home. Thank you. And I should mention, she is a member of the um, reinvestigation work group that does this work. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, yes, my name is Emma. Um, my name is Emma Peterson, and I'm a volunteer with CUAPB. Uh, I actually started volunteering for CUAPB right after Thurman Blevins was killed in 2018. Uh, I'm also a dual degree master's student um, in both the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota. Um, I came to the story of Thurman Blevins uh, because my sister and I and my family, we had experiences with the Minneapolis Police Department. Like I said earlier, I was a Minneapolis police explorer for five and a half years. Both my sister and I experienced sexual harassment as well as retaliation when we tried to complain about harassment and other issues in the Minneapolis Police Explorer program. The retaliation, my sister was physically threatened by police officers, she was followed, I was threatened, my career was threatened when we questioned the police department and when we spoke out about what we were seeing and the problems we were seeing. I was clearly not the right type of blue for the Minneapolis Police Department. That is why we started speaking out, we started going to community meetings, and then Thurman Blevins was killed. In August of 2018, my sister and I testified at the Minneapolis City Council meeting after the uproar of Thurman's death. And we talked about how in the Police Explorers program, they train you to use deadly force and to justify using deadly force by simply stating the law of Minnesota. So what they will do is in use of force scenarios and explore training programs, 
after the scenario is completed, they will say, memorize this use of force statute, which is 609.066. And it's changed, but at the time, it was, you simply had to say, I was in fear for my life or the life of others, and that is why I chose the decision to use deadly force. In this case with Thurman Blevins, I want us all to keep in mind that Thurman was not the only one who was put in danger by those two Minneapolis police officers that day. It was also the Mr. Uh, Case who was in the alley as well as his girlfriend who nearly died because Officer Kelly and Officer Schmidt recklessly fired into an alley around 6.30 p.m. on a night. Uh, this was a summer night, children were out in the area, people were having dinner, they could have harmed somebody else because they recklessly fired. I want us all to keep in mind too that Thurman was trying to de-escalate with those officers. Uh, Thurman, when he jumped up after they came out yelling and screaming at him with their guns pointed out, he asked why. He said, come on man, my liquor. Then he dropped the liquor because that's what he thought it was about and he said, it's back there, it's back there and he didn't understand that they were pursuing him for a gun that he had bought in only three hours earlier. Thurman was trying to de-escalate that situation that day. The officers certainly weren't. They certainly weren't concerned for public safety because they were a greater risk to public safety that day. Um, so with that in mind, I just want to uh, thank the COAPB for this investigation, for all the resources we've put into it, and I also want to give my condolences to the family um, because I can never understand how difficult this must be, um, and my thoughts to them. Thank you. Our final speaker is um, Keith McCarran, and he actually knew Thurman and knew a little bit about his family, and so he wants to talk for a minute about um, what Thurman was going through on that day. So uh, the thing that I wanted to point out was it's been stated repeatedly that Thurman was very intoxicated. The part that the police department didn't tell you about that was that Thurman was preparing to bury his sister. And Thurman was in extreme grief. And that's why Thurman was sitting out on the stoop drinking liquor. It wasn't like it was a common everyday occurrence for him. The thing that I find most impactful is the last words that he ever spoke in his life. As he was running away long before they said that they saw the gun, or I'm sorry, long before they said that he had pointed the gun, the officer said, I'm going to shoot you. And Thurman's last words that he spoke in his life were, please don't shoot me, leave me alone. That was before he even allegedly pulled out a gun. Nobody should have to die like that. They could have walked away. We thank you for coming here today and for um, learning about this information. We think this information is extremely important. We think it's uh, extremely damning and it shows how the system operates to deny people justice. Um, what we'd like to know now is if you have any questions. Has the family members seen the report that you've done? Yes, they actually contributed and assisted with the preparation of this report. What did they um, you know, uh, that we, what we do is we meet weekly to do this work, and we met over a, about a ten and a half month period, and um, family members were at those meetings all along the way. And that's how long it took to compile the yes. investigation? Yes, yeah. because you have to understand that when they give you a 2,165-page report, first of all, when the BCA gives you a report, it's a huge report, and it's not indexed, it's not sorted, it's in a PDF form that's not searchable, it's like, and it's in no particular order. It looked almost to us as if somebody had dropped the papers on the floor and they went everywhere, then they just gathered them all back up, and that turned into a report. I honestly cannot believe and I truly do not believe that anybody at um, Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman's office even read the report, sorted it out. We actually developed, um, we converted the file, we developed an index for that file so that we ourselves could work with it. We developed numerous spreadsheets. I worked on the, the forensics part of that report and I had a giant spreadsheet of all the forensics reports, what, you know, what, what the item was. Um, what it showed, you know, when was it tested, by whom, and what did it show. So we have all of this kinds of stuff, and th these things take time. And again, 
remember that we are all volunteers. No one pays us to do this. So we have to do this in you know um, two to three hours a week, week in and week out. Have you ever done this type of an investigation to... to we have done a little bit of that kind of um, work around uh, a few other cases. Uh, previously, the Walter Burks case comes to mind, Courtney Williams, the um, Jamar Clark case, a few other things like that, but never to this deep of an extent. Um, and um, I have to tell you that the people that are on that work group, Nicole, Emma, and the others on the work group, are truly amazing. They catch things, they see things that you just cannot imagine that anybody would, would notice. Um, and even in, including going out to the scene, measuring to figure out that Kelly, you know, based on where a fence was located and where a grease stain was and thing in the road and so forth, to figure out where Kelly was versus Schmidt, all of that. And we put out markers, we took pictures, we did an extensive amount of work on that. Um, this work group is working on um, two other cases right now, in fact. Um, so we actually have work groups, two different work groups going right now doing this kind of work. Unfortunately and sadly, it's necessary because the people who get paid to do this work refuse to do a decent job. And in fact, the work they do is um, set up in order to validate the, um, the prevailing police narrative. Yes. Other questions? Just, uh, Nicole, is that, can yes. you use your last name again? Kesselring, K-E-S-S-E-L-R-I-N-G. Thank you. Yep. And Schmidt and uh, Kelly's record, uh, what's their past record like? You know, I didn't bring that with me today, but it's available on our website, um, and you can grab that off. Uh, but again, I think that the most telling things about their record is that um, Schmidt is a, was at that time, and I don't know if he still is, a trainer with Archway. Um, Defense Company, which is a, um, a fear-based training company, and the um, uh, and, uh, and Kelly is an EMS instructor, and I believe he is to this day, and yet he couldn't be bothered to give care to a man that's laying there groaning and moving about, which I think is you know really again quite outrageous. Um, I want to mention that we are going to be having a demonstration on Friday. Um, and a vigil outside of the BCA, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, at 1430 Maryland Avenue um, on Friday with family members at 530 in order to um, really denounce the work that the BCA does in terms of um, shoring up the police narrative on these cases. We've seen it every single time we've looked at their work, and it is unacceptable. And I think that it's quite telling that some of the members of the team that investigate police deadly force incidents have themselves engaged in deadly force. And so I don't think these people can be said to be unbiased in any way. Um, they rely on their relationship with police to do their work, but more than that, they are police themselves. And so, um, and again, some of whom have killed people, people themselves. And so we really do not believe that they are unbiased or that they even have the capacity to be unbiased. And so we have got to take these investigations out of their hands. They're not valid, they're not proper, um, they're not unbiased, and they have done an extremely poor job in these cases. And so that is our among our demands. What are your next steps? Do you plan on, uh, have you met with uh, the Attorney General's office? Do you plan to meet with them to, to go over this material? I've actually attempted to communicate with them multiple times about this material. Um, they did not return my calls um, multiple times or my um, emails to them multiple times. Um, I find that very distressing. We have important information that is um, of, of very significant interest, should be of very significant interest to them. We have shared this information with the Department of Justice in their investigation of the Minneapolis police as well as with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. And so we're going, um, we, you know, we're attempting to get the, the Attorney General's office interested. It hasn't happened thus far. Um, you know, we, we will continue our loud demands that the BCA be shut down, that they no longer investigate these cases, that there be an independent, um, you know, body to do that. And we will take that bill back to the legislature again this session. We had it in the legislature last session. It did not get a hearing, but we will take it right back to the legislature again. Other questions? Okay, well with that, thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.